Our Story Production presents The Road to Our Story, spotlighting an in-depth look at many of The Road to Our Story magazine's featured articles. So get ready, for you're about to travel on The Road to Our Story. Hello, I'm Jason Howland, and welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. Sawing logs, it's not only a physical and risky job, it's also an appropriate analogy for snoring, and it can sometimes be as loud as a chainsaw and just as dangerous. Joining us today is Dr. Shamsul Hassan, board certified internal medicine specialist at Fairmont Medical Center and sleep lab director at Fairmont Medical Center, and Dave McKnight, a patient who's been to the sleep lab in Fairmont. Thank you both for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Thanks for having us. Well, uh, first off, I'll start with you, Dr. Hassan. What exactly is sleep apnea? Does it simply mean that you snore at night? It's actually more than snoring. Uh, sleep apnea means that somebody quit uh, uh, breathing in their sleep repetitiously to the point that the oxygen level goes down and the person wakes up frequently, not necessarily to the behavior level of knowing that they did wake up. So it, uh, that's what sleep apnea is. So is snoring a cause or a symptom of sleep apnea? Uh, snoring is associated with sleep mm -hmm. apnea. So if somebody has problems of loud snoring, which is very disruptive, it's likely that person has sleep apnea syndrome. So what exactly causes people to snore? Snoring is the vibratory noise that's produced by the turbulent airflow in the narrowed airway due to the collapsibility of the upper airway muscles. And uh, are there other causes like uh, being overweight, uh, uh, what you eat, that kind of thing too? Yes. If somebody is overweight or somebody has inherently narrow upper airway or if somebody smokes or has uh, allergy problems or if somebody drinks alcohol closer towards the bedtime, they have high risks of snoring. And again, these are also sometimes associated with sleep apnea syndrome. And sleep apnea is actually stopping breathing while you're sleeping, which sounds extremely dangerous. What can happen? It is. Uh, sleep apnea means that uh, upper airway muscles are collapsible to the point that somebody quit or stop breathing altogether before they wake up again because the body's inherent system wakes the person up. And uh, so what happens is that if somebody uh, stops breathing repetitiously throughout the night, the oxygen level in the blood goes down and that wakes somebody up. And uh, it also, through complex mechanisms, causes damage to the arteries of the heart and the brain. So it is uh, potentially very dangerous. So actually, uh, uh, severe snoring at night can potentially cause Heart attack, stroke? Yes. If somebody has snoring, there's a high likelihood that person also has sleep apnea syndrome. So sleep apnea, um, the immediate effect of sleep apnea is excessive daytime sleepiness or fatigue the next day. So somebody who already had slept about eight to nine hours at night could have a fragmented and poor quality sleep. So the next day, the person that person feels tired and sleepy. But over the long term, it causes uh, damage to the arteries of the heart and brain, leading to heart attack and stroke, uncontrolled hypertension, irregular heart rhythm, and worsening of heart failure. Severe stuff. Uh, well, Dave, tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, how long ago, first of all, were you diagnosed with sleep apnea? Well, in uh, October of 2009, I had a heart attack. And when I, when I was in the uh, hospital, they told me that I wasn't getting enough oxygen when I slept, and that probably meant that I had sleep apnea. So then you went to the sleep lab? I went to a sleep lab here in Fairmont, and they definitely found that I did have sleep apnea. Um, they have also found out that I had a, a different kind of a sleep apnea than, that, than most people do. Mine was, in, I think, in the 10% range. And so then I had to go to Rochester and, and do it again because they needed to use a different type of technology on me. So what symptoms were you having at that time, other than obviously the severe symptom of having a heart attack, but were you having other symptoms as well? Um, I was having a hard time sleeping. 
I was always tired. Uh, I want to take all these cat naps during the day. Uh, just no energy. And had snoring been a problem all of your life? I've always snored a little bit. I don't snore real loud, uh, which is I think it's different for you know it's different for each patient mm -hmm. that has that. But I never did snore very loud, but I did snore. And then I, my wife tells me that I would stop breathing during the night. And that puts up automatic red flags. Right. Um, so when you went to the sleep lab in Fairmont, what, uh, what was that experience like? What happened? Well, it was quite interesting. You go in and they hook you up. Uh, and they got all these things on your head and then on your chest. And it even goes down to your feet. Uh, and then they, you go into a room and they hook you up. And there's a camera that watches you. And it tell you know they look for how many times you wake up in a night, and, and they also they take all the vital stats of of what your heartbeat and I think brain activity and and all different things, and and then they watch that for while you sleep. And it's not just a hospital room; it actually looks like a bedroom. Right? Yeah, it's right; it's a bedroom. Mm -hmm. Doctor Hassan, what are some of the uh, some of the uh, equipment that uh, that Dave's talking about that's used uh, on the patient uh, when they're in the sleep lab? Yes, the sleep lab, uh, uh, the sleep study is basically uh, it has two parts. The uh, first part is the diagnostic part, and uh, during the diagnostic part, the sleep is comprehensively monitored quantitated and qualified by the way of monitoring the brain wave and the monitoring of the eyeball movements, uh, which help us to stage the sleep, then the heart rhythm monitoring, and then uh, uh, it is found out how many times a person is breathing, uh, uh, quitting to breathe or breathing shallow to the point that the oxygen level is going down, how loud is the snoring, what are the abnormal movements of the limbs, etc. So there are about seven or eight parameters which are closely monitored. Um, uh, the second part of the study is called the therapeutic part, and if somebody is found to have a significant remarkable sleep apnea syndrome, then a CPAP titration is done. It's found out what is the airflow device's pressure that is optimum to keep the airway open so that the person breathes appropriately and adequately and doesn't drop oxygen in the uh, night, and it also abolishes the snoring. So second part is for therapeutic purpose. So Dave, uh, after you were at the sleep lab in Fairmont and then at Mayo Clinic, uh, you were uh, prescribed uh, an apparatus to help you sleep, right? Right. And my apparatus has, a, it's a full face mask that goes on, and uh, it also has a, uh, you put water in it because it's, it's got a humidifier in it because it would, you know, just dry you out so bad that if you didn't use it, uh, the humidifier part of it, it would be uncomfortable. So what has it been like since you've started using that? I have a lot more energy. I don't take all those cat naps during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I sleep, I go to sleep easier. I sleep longer. And is it uncomfortable wearing, wearing it at all? Not really. Uh, it does fit kind of tight because I have to have, this one has to be able to not have very much leakage on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the ones that you put on your nose, but uh, not, not really, but I do sometimes wake up with it and, mm -hmm. it and it's not on, but I don't know if I hit it and it falls off or, or what. And does it also make your sleep quieter? <laughs> yes, it does. And that's one thing my wife says, I, you know, I, I don't snore. Mm -hmm. at all when I'm using that and uh, the only thing that wakes her up is uh, if I get a kink in the hose and then the machine goes off and mm -hmm. makes a real loud <laughs> buzz so uh, Dr. Hassan is there help for people who snore and especially for those who suffer from sleep apnea is there help like uh, what Dave had with the CPAP machine yes I mean if somebody has problems of snoring uh, uh, and no sleep apnea then the best strategy would be to try to lose weight uh, try to quit smoking, and, and one should not drink alcohol closer to the bedtime. And there's one thing we call the positional therapy in which somebody can sleep on their side and not on the back. And there are some strategies like tennis ball t-shirt, etc., which can be adopted. And there are uh, devices available in the market which can help you to stop snoring. But if it's sleep apnea, then uh, treatment of snoring is not adequate in that case. In addition to the conservative measures such as losing weight and trying to quit smoking, etc. Somebody may have to use a CPAP machine or BiPAP machine, which by airflow would keep the airway open to the point that it would not collapse and occlude itself up during the sleep.
And how does the CPAP machine work? It's just a mechanical airflow device. I mean, what, what happens is that the airflow uh, keeps the upper airway open to the point that it does not collapse and stays open so the oxygen level throughout the night stays steady so uh, somebody who has sleep apnea syndrome does not wake up frequently and the sleep quality is tremendously enhanced. So if you enhance that sleep quality, will that also uh, improve your health? Will that uh, lower your blood pressure and that kind of thing? Sure, you do. Uh, uh, the immediately perceivable benefits would be uh, more energy, more wakefulness. But long term, it is just like any chronic disease. It, uh, the risks of heart attack and stroke would go down. The control of diabetes would be better if somebody has it. And it would also help to control the blood pressure better. And it would reduce the chances or risks of heart failure and irregular heart rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation. Dave, how are you feeling now? Uh, it's been... Uh, almost a year since uh, you uh, got your CPAP, right? Right. How are, how, are, how is your health overall? A lot better. I, I've lost weight. Um, I think I went from 235 down to 190 right now. And um, it, I just feel a lot better. I mean, I, like I said, I've got more rest. I, I sleep at night. I have more energy to do things. Dr. Hassan, you heard Dave's story. He actually had a heart attack um, but had the sleep study, now has the CPAP machine. Does that decrease his risk now for uh, having another heart attack? Certainly it does. I mean, uh, if, if he uh, is using his CPAP machine regularly, then it is definitely modifying the risk factor. So, Dr. Hassan, uh, is sleep apnea, is it more common in older adults, or does age not matter, and also with gender? It usually is. It, uh, if people uh, are older, they have a higher risk of uh, sleep apnea syndrome. And uh, it is also said that uh, males are at higher risk of sleep apnea than uh, females. How about uh, uh, symptoms? Uh, uh, you know, a lot of folks get tired during the day. Um, but is there a certain point where you, where you should really uh, seriously consider about coming into the sleep lab to have a sleep study done? If anybody has sleep apnea syndrome, they may feel excessively sleepy during the daytime. He was mentioning about catnaps. That's mm -hmm. how the person of so ex excessive daytime sleepiness would be characterized. Uh, fatigue, undue fatigue, despite other uh, examination being normal. Um, irritability, personality change, uh, difficulty concentrating, and most dangerous is uh, falling asleep behind the driving wheel. Mm -hmm. So these are the uh, usual symptoms uh, patients complain about. And probably another big helper is uh, uh, your partner. If yeah. observing uh, loud snoring or like in Dave's case, his, his wife saying, you know, uh, observing him stopping breathing while he's sleeping, right? Sure. Collateral history is very important here because if somebody has sleep apnea, they wouldn't know much. It's mm -hmm. their bed partner who would give us the most useful and important data, mm -hmm. such as witnessed apnea or uh, loud snoring. How about uh, the technology? Is the technology improving uh, for patients with sleep apnea as, as we move forward in the future? The sleep study itself is a very technology intensive study. It's a very sophisticated study. And the interventional technology is also evolving and getting more user friendly over the years. So people would be finding it easier to use mm -hmm. over the next coming years. And they are already finding it easy and comfortable to ease, use nowadays. So Dave, uh, uh, overall, are you happy that you did the sleep study? Oh, yes. Has it been, a, a, I'm assuming, a great improvement for your life? Oh, yes, it has. In, in what ways? I'm able to do more. I can concentrate more on what I'm doing. Um, just my, the quality of my overall life is just a lot better. And it was all something that you probably weren't even aware was happening? No. I had no clue. So, Dr. Hassan, how do you measure sleep apnea in a sleep study? Sleep apnea is measured by the unit of AHI, that means apnea hypopnea index, and that helps us to measure how severe the sleep apnea is. If the AHI is between 5 to 14, that's mild. If it's between 15 to 29, it's moderate. If it's more than 30, then it's severe sleep apnea syndrome. So there are uh, patients that are stopping breathing more than 30 times a night. Yes, it could be uh, 30 times to I, I have or we have seen patients who stop breathing about like or breathe shallow up to like 100 times for wow. sleep hour. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But I want to thank our guests, Dave McKnight and Dr. Shamsul Hassan, for joining us today on Speaking of Health, a great topic. Thank you.
And have a great day, everyone, and be healthy. There you have it, folks. One of the favorite stories ripped from the pages of The Road to Our Story magazine. Let's have a look at another. Well, there's another great feature from uh, On the Road to Our Story. I'm Al Travis. I'm your guest host for First in a Series. I'm from Between the Lines of the program. We also cable cast across the state of Minnesota. Nothing as fancy pants as our story, but I appreciate you letting me here. I'm here to introduce and uh, chat with uh, Jeff Rouse. Jeff, you're the man. You're the man who made this happen. Well, Al, thank you very much. I, I appreciate I'm it. In, I'm impressed. Just let's start with background on, on your program. Um, starts out a little fa Fairmont, Minnesota. You come up with this idea for our story mm -hmm. and Sweet Swine County and all the rest. Correct. And this little thing you created is huge. Maybe I mean, it's not Oprah Winfrey huge right. yet, but you're in a million plus household. We're in a million two households now. And uh, we're very excited about that. And how it kind of began is you probably know, Al. Uh, in 97, uh, we had a show here in Fairmont that uh, talked about what's happening in Fairmont and the surrounding area that you were involved with yep. and did a great job for 13 years promoting the community that was a long time. and the businesses, right, yep. and did it for 13 years very well. I was complaining to some different people, other business people here in town, how it's a shame this is gone, we need this kind of programming, and much to your surprise, you know what people said, well, that's, why don't you do it? That's, <laughs> that's, well, that's because, because most of the time people then just let that ball drop and Absolutely. not do it, but you picked it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is interesting, I mean, this has gone beyond, I mean, you take that little bud of what's going on in the Fairmont area, and you are all throughout southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, South Dakota, I mean, you, Wisconsin, I mean, you have just blown this thing out. And you have story after story after, I mean, all these little towns have such cool things to be talked about. Absolutely. But you can't get them if you're not out there videotaping and put them on. Well, you know what we discovered? Uh, when, we, when we did it here in Fairmont, we wanted to do something different and kind of quirky and entertaining, yes. which, which we did. We aired it locally. Uh, we put it on the Internet. Now, I'm kind of an old guy. So, okay. uh, you know, I don't know much about the internet. So when somebody suggests, why don't you just put it on the internet and do a website? And I'm like, well, I suppose. So we did. And once it hit the internet, towns and communities started to contact us saying, why can't you promote us like that? And then it kind of started with that. See, and, 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 and then it grows on itself. And, and what kills me, and, and you do the storylines, I presume. Mm -hmm. I mean, we watch and, and some, and I, I use the funeral scene uh, from a couple of years back that I just, it, it gets in your head and it, it just sticks there. <laughs> it is some corny television. <laughs> That's right, exactly. But it's phenomenal. I mean, it, for those who didn't see the funeral scene, you gotta look it up on the website. But basically no one talked. They were all at a funeral and then you're hearing what they thought and it was genius. Oh, well, thank you. Now and you write those skit, skits, I don't wanna call it skits. You, you're the one doing the soap opera, am I Well, right? what, we, what we've done is over the last few years doing this, of course, more and more and more people become involved. Yeah. Originally, I wrote most of the soap opera and a lot of the other different programs. And uh, our production person, Shelley Abbott, from Gemini here in town, who does all of the editing mm -hmm. and all of the production. She has taken over completely the writing of the soap opera, doing an awesome job. And I have to say, a lot of the story ideas come from our volunteers and my wife and myself and Shelly herself, who are getting together going, you know what would be very funny. See, and I don't, I don't think, for folks who watch it, it isn't just a, uh, a bunch of Mutt and Jeffs in Fairmont that had nothing better to do. You got lawyers in here, the banker from my <laughs> town right. in Blue Earth in That's here, right. Gallat owns the, the, the shop right down the mall. I, these are prominent business people in our That's community. Correct. That's correct. That will dress up and become Elmer Plow, for an example. Crazy characters. And there's. But how do you do that? Give me, how do you talk someone into that? Well, as, as one of our characters told me, I would like to think we just invite them nicely and then they become involved. One of our characters uh, uh, told me recently, his girlfriend came with him to a shoot. Okay. And I says, you know, we would like you to do something on our show. And she says, what would you like us, me to do? And I said, would you consider being an extra? And she says, well, yeah, sure, I'll be an extra in a scene. And, and uh, uh, the gentleman who's already involved says, be careful, be careful. <laughs> this is how it starts. How it starts. First, first they ask you to be an extra. Then they ask you, could you say a line? 
and then pretty soon you have a whole line, and the next thing you know, you're home reading script. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and there's something to the. I mean, you, you've taken this, and I'll give you Oprah Winfrey compliments. You've taken this show and this one idea, and now it's not just our story or as the corn grows, and it's 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 all the different segments you've got leading into the car stuff. You, you've got a magazine now, mm -hmm. um, uh, The Road to Our Story. The website's amazing to me in that uh, I'm actually Facebook friends with caricatures. Yeah. That's that's genius to be actually honest well, with you. you. I mean, I don't know how many friends they've got, but I know they've got. I've got two of your characters that are friends of mine on sure. Facebook. I mean, where does that come from? Where? How is? What's driving this? I mean, and your website. What did you tell me before? Six hundred episodes are on your website. I mean, you people. We have uh, six hundred segments on the website now. That's uh, the the different programs like As the Corn Grows, the soap opera that has become probably one of our most popular segments, uh, has even received national recognition, been nominated for an independent soap opera award at New York City two times. Very so cool. we're very proud of that. But the whole premise behind the show is to promote these small towns for sure. because we feel that uh, as most do, there's a lot in these towns that isn't being said. Or nobody knows about. If we can promote it in a unique, fun way, people will find out what's in these towns. And now we're spotlighting 90 towns and aired in a million too. But how do you how, how do you pick them? Give me this, because there's a lot of small towns in the world, a lot of, a lot of cool places in the world. But how do you go out there and find that small town? And then how do you find that that guy, the guy with the weird shop that you see? And what do you, how do you how do you pick and choose? Where do you find the stories? Primarily, there's three or four of us to go out quite a bit, and we explore communities. And we're looking for certain things. We come in the town pretty much unannounced. Okay. Uh, and we come in and we look around. Uh, be quite honest, I always, my style is I go to the local cafe. Okay. And I go to the cafe and have a bite to eat. And I ask the waitress, so what's happening here in town? Well, they know, you know, we have an Edie's here in town. Uh, if you went and asked them, they know what's sure. happening in town. And same in every little community. So we go to the community. We find out what's happening. Once we find out they have, if they have festivals, events, activities, special groups, interesting businesses, and a wide assortment of things happening, we want to cover them because okay. we want to show what's happening in that town. So how does that get started? I mean, you got an atlas and obviously you can drive through towns. Can a, can a town can a town call you? Can can the, the mayor of a town, can the uh, what chamber guy, can they get a hold of you? How do Absolutely. they do that? Absolutely, and that has happened numerous times where a town contacts us, they're familiar with our show, they know how we're promoting other shows, and they say, Jeff, how can we become involved? And first thing I say is, we're going to come and take a look at your town. We check out their website, we check out their events, their activities, what's happening, and if there's enough for us to cover, we will make uh, have them uh, be part of our, our story family, so to speak. But we, we have to have enough to promote in their town, sure. or it doesn't benefit them, and it doesn't make for good television. Ironically, the size of the town, we have several towns that have less than 500 people. And you would think there's nothing going on there. No. It's not true. Yeah. Everybody thinks these small towns are dying and there's nothing there. Now, nobody's naive enough not to realize there's problems uh, with all these small communities and getting along. However, there's still viable businesses, viable points of interest, and activities and things going on in every single community. And it kind of, I would imagine, because if, let's use the 500-person town that only has a few businesses, they, they have a tougher time advertising that, letting the folks know. So if they can get a, a story in, in our story or on the road, then all of a sudden, give you know, a million, 200,000 households right. are at least getting a glimpse of them and saying, well, next time we drive by on I-90, we should, we should wing in there. Exactly. And, and what we found, too, is these towns uh, really want to show what they have and should because they are interesting. So then talk me through the progression. You start with the, the, the bud the, the, mm -hmm. the, as the corn grows, mm -hmm. and you build segment after segment. What makes, how does it make the cut? I mean, do you just come up you know, lying around at night coming up with a million stories? How do you decide what gets to be the next big thing in the show? Every show, uh, we have talk shows. The whole show, the whole program is, takes place in the fictitious county of Sweet Swine County. Yeah. Unfortunately, nothing happens in Sweet Swine County. So therefore, all of our talk shows have to talk about what's happening in their neighboring towns and counties. That's the rub. Gotcha. Now, so our guests on our talk shows talk about 
uh, what's happening in other communities, whether it be a festival, an interesting business, and different things like that. Each town gets a spotlight that is an overview of what they have to offer. It is aired in all of our communities. But you do think you got the basis. librarian, you got the guy driving down the road with the, the strange convertible with sure. the wheel that just keeps <laughs> jogging. I mean, and I say that in all, all I love it. I mean, I'm not saying that to make fun, but how do they make the cut? I mean, and maybe this is my next question. Are you still in need of folks? If, do they come to you with an idea, or do you come with an idea and then find the guy to get in the car, or the gal to be the librarian? There is or? constantly new ideas coming. New ideas coming. We, like I say, we have 52 volunteers now. We have quite a few people that have asked to be on that we're developing characters for. Okay. So it continues to grow. No one has ever left. This that is, is exciting. This is great fun. It, and how long have you been doing it? Uh, just about four years. See, that's amazing. If you have four years and no one stopped. I mean, no that... one stopped. Because it's fun. These people believe in small towns as well as they believe uh, we can have fun promoting them. We never make fun of a town. We never make fun of an event. We never make fun of a festival. Now, the person talking about your event or festival might, might be, be just some zany character. But that's what makes it entertaining and something different. So much of local television, God love the people are doing, can turn into just a talking head yeah. with two mics, with a mic. And what we wanted to do is do something different. So when somebody watches it, they go, literally, what the heck is this? Well, and the thing, the thing that gets me about the program is it is just bingo, bingo, bingo. You you don't get bored. It's not like when's the next commercial coming. It's like bam, when's the next entertaining thing coming? You know, it's you. By the time you're done, you're almost out of breath with all that you've just taken in. Well, thank you, and, and I mean that as a compliment. I mean, you, you laugh at our, as the corn grows. I mean, you're, you're laughing at that, and then bam, all of a sudden you're in some town and some weird characters. <laughs> you know, right. the scientist guy. Right? I mean, all of a sudden you're like, what's going on? It, it is. It is uh, amazing television. Well, thank you. And, you know, we could never have accomplished this or being a, uh, accomplishing what we're doing if it wasn't for the volunteers and staff. Yeah. We have tremendous people. Gemini with Shelly is key. She's a big part. How big Myself, an organization do you think you're, 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 you're running, if you will? We have seven full-time people wow. and then 52 volunteers. And, again, if it wasn't for the volunteers, believe me, we could not accomplish this uh, at all. And where do we see it going from here? Can you give us a quick uh, pie in the sky? What do you see between, two years, four between years Between the magazine, the website, and the television show, uh, and the response that we're getting from the public, I have no doubt we'll continue to add more and more towns. So uh, we're very excited about that. We're very proud to be promoting these small towns in a unique way because they all have something to offer. And if we don't do it, who will? I love it. Now, how do they get a hold of you? If someone's seeing this today and there's 1.2 million homes, how do they get a hold of you? How do they, they get a hold of you to get a hold The of you? best way to take a look at us in all, everything we do, every single thing is on the website. And like I say, we have over 600 videos already done on our website. All of our contact information for us is on there, as well as we are about to put a listing of where you can see it in any community that it is aired in in the near future. Outstanding. Jeff, a great job. Absolutely. Oh, You're doing you outstanding. Hosting. No, no. Thank you for letting me host uh, On the Road to Our Story. I'm Al Travis with Between the Lines. Watch that too when you got time when you're not watching him. See you again next time on the next special edition of On the Road to Our Story.